Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for the Singapore Norway Innovation Conference Day 2 program on maritime digitalization and decarbonization. I wish those joining us from Norway a very good morning and those in Singapore a very good afternoon. I am Daniel from Innovation Norway and I will be the host for today's program. Here to give us the welcome message for the event is Mr. Paul Kasman. Paul is the Director of Innovation Norway Singapore, which constitutes the commercial and science section of the Norwegian Embassy in Singapore. He is also the Chairman of the Nordic Innovation House in Singapore and is a board member of the Norwegian Business Association Singapore. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Daniel. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to day two of Singapore Norway Innovation Conference and this session on maritime digitalization and decarbonization. My name is Paul Kastner and I'm the Director of Innovation Norway here in Singapore. Um, Innovation Norway constitutes the uh, commercial and science section of uh, the Norwegian Embassy here. Um, and we work closely with Norwegian companies and uh, research institutions as well as their counterparts in uh, Singapore. Uh, I'm also the chairman of Nordic Innovation House in Singapore, that some of you might have heard of. Uh, and I also sit with uh, Leonard Stolness, uh, who will follow shortly, uh, on the board of NBAS. Um, for those of you that followed yesterday's program, uh, we addressed some of the global challenges that are shaping our time and how Singapore and Norway are working with uh, the green transition. The main takeaway, I think, is the need for urgency. Uh, on the flip side, uh, with large challenges come large opportunities. How can smart, sustainable solutions help us solve these challenges? Today, we will take a closer look at specific problem statements within the maritime and urban dimensions. We have decided to run two parallel sessions to do the topics justice. One is addressing circular economy in an urban setting, uh, and the other is uh, uh, addressing maritime digitalization and decarbonization. Now, digitalization and decarbonization are, without a doubt, two of the hottest topics in the maritime industry right now. It is seen as a way to innovate and create sustainability in the maritime industry. These are broad topics, and there are numerous elements to address. In uh, this conference, we are looking at the possibilities of new technologies arising from developments in the maritime communications. We're looking at VDES, we're looking at uh, 5G, uh, we're looking at aerial drones, subsea drones. And we're also looking at solutions and perspectives for bunkering of alternative fuels. The Singapore Norway Innovation Conference aims to focus on these two topics from the lens of Singaporean and Norwegian maritime industry stakeholders. And we are proud to have some of the top maritime experts from both countries with us today. The purpose of this event is to encourage sharing of ideas, technology, and best practices between Singapore and Norway. Innovation Norway aims to promote and facilitate more industry and cross-country collaborations between Singapore and Norway. Um, and we would also like to thank our close partners, Enterprise Singapore and the Maritime and Port Authorities of Singapore, as well as our distinguished guests uh, for their support for this event. And with that, I would like to give the word to Leonor Stones. Leo, the floor is yours. A very warm welcome to the second day of Singapore Norway Innovation Conference. We live in a world with constant changes and high level of uncertainties, but we are all aware of the driving forces within our societies and the operating environment with clear trends towards digitalization, decarbonization, alternative fuel, focus on sustainability, circular economy, clean recycling, and the handling of food waste. These are all areas of expertise where many Norwegian companies and universities have core knowledge and experience and should in many respects be natural partners for the authorities and businesses in Singapore. I therefore hope that the discussions today will help in the process with developing synergies between Singapore and Norway as Singapore also has a lot to offer Norway. If you are not yet connected to the Norwegian Business Association, but would like to know more, reach out to us and we look forward to have a conversation with you. I would like to thank Innovation Norway and the Royal Norwegian Embassy in Singapore for the very good cooperation during the planning 
and organizing of Singapore Norway Innovation Conference. And I hope that you all find value in the topic and discussions that will be on the agenda today. Thank you. Thank you, Leo and Paul, for the welcome messages to start us off today's program. We have an exciting lineup of speakers and panelists from both Singapore and Norway with us today. They will share plenty of perspectives, ideas, and solutions in the course of today's program. To start us off on the segment on maritime digitalization, we have two distinguished keynote speakers, Mr. Thomas Ting and Captain John Leon Ervik. They are representing the Port Authority of Singapore and Norwegian Coastal Administration, respectively. As you hear their keynote speeches, please feel free to put in your questions into the Q&A function, and we will have the keynote speakers to address some of these questions towards the end of the session. We shall start with Mr. Thomas Ting. Thomas is currently the Chief Technology Officer from the Maritime Port Authority of Singapore, or the MPA in short. MPA is the driving force behind Singapore's port and maritime development, taking on the roles of port authority, port regulator, port planner, international maritime center champion, and national maritime representative. Thomas is responsible for developing Singapore as a leading global maritime technology hub. His division administers the Maritime Innovation and Technology Fund, or MINT, as well as industry development programs. He works with the Singapore Maritime Institute to grow maritime R&D capabilities, and fosters strong collaboration with international partners such as Research Council of Norway and Innovation Norway. He's also part of the planning and execution team for Sea Transport Industry Transformation Map, Next Generation Port and Supply Chain Digitalization Group. Thomas, please. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. In this session, I'll be talking about MPA strategies to develop the innovation ecosystem and accelerate digital transformation. Let me start by sharing that I've been promoting close collaboration between Singapore and Norway maritime and innovation communities for the last 10 years. This includes our strong collaboration with the Research Council of Norway and Innovation Norway on joint events such as the Singapore-Norway Innovation Conference we have today as well as the International Maritime and Port Technology Conference, or MTEC, in short. The next MTEC and the International Conference for Maritime Autonomous Surface Ships, ICMAS, will be held in Singapore in April 2020 during Singapore Maritime Week. Pre-pandemic, MPA and the Singapore Maritime Institute also led many mission trips to Norway to discuss joint initiatives, participate in joint conference and workshops. There are many global trends and drivers that many of us are keeping a close watch on, such as the changes in global supply chain, consumer behaviors, changes in policies and regulations due to climate change, safety reasons, or new technologies disrupting uh, existing regulations and processes, as well as the recalibration of strategies by enterprises under the new normal. Innovation and technology is key in transforming the way we work, the way we communicate, the way machines work and serve our needs, and the way enterprises build new capabilities and competitiveness. Squeezing more outputs from existing workforce or doubling down more manpower into decade-old processes are not sustainable, not long-term solutions. I firmly believe we must put high priority and investment into science, technology, innovation, and talent to move the industry forward. Having said that, Innovation and technology alone cannot solve all the problems that we face today. There are other enabling factors that determine whether we could succeed. These include policies and regulations, infrastructure, standards and interoperability, finance, cost of adoption, customer awareness and acceptance, and workforce competencies to handle new technology. This is a simple representation of the innovation ecosystem that we have been building over the last two decades. Singapore's maritime industry, which is a bit different from Norway, uh, is in, highlighted in green here, comprises port, shipping, maritime services, and certain aspects of the marine and offshore. 
they form the core of what we do because most of the innovation and R&D projects arise from the need to tackle major industry challenges and opportunities. And we work with this group of demand drivers to co-create industry challenge statements and problem statements, increase their propensity and willingness to work with external innovators and to provide domain knowledge, data and test building opportunities on their vessels or port facilities. The group in red is what we call the solver community. This could be the technology developers, engineering companies, startups or researchers. They look at the challenges you share with them to firstly decide whether is it worth their time looking at the problems. If there are high impact problem statements, there will be many tech developers and researchers interested to solve the big problems. That is the key. The brown group on the right are the enablers that we collectively as, a, as an ecosystem have put in place so that we provide an enabling environment for the ecosystem actors to collaborate and innovate more effectively. I will talk about more about some of these enablers in the subsequent slides. First on the collaboration platforms, MPA initiated the SmartPort Hackathon in 2014 followed by the Smart Port Challenge in 2017, and eventually the Peer Center One with NUS Enterprise in 2018. We have partnered over 50 maritime and port companies and 10 venture capitalists, accelerated and groomed over 60 startups, not including the 20 from this year batch, funded over 30 of them, and deployed 13 of these tech solutions to the maritime industries. Four of these startups received their VC investment over the last 18 months, and 50% of these startups are from overseas. The startup ecosystem is one potential area where Singapore and Norway can collaborate more closely to provide greater access to the international markets and technology partners. But collaborating with startups is not just about solving problems. It is also to help companies to scan for emerging disruptive ideas and technology and their potential applications for the industries, or to discover new joint ventures and partners and customers, or to discover investment opportunities. It is useful to note that some big innovation did not originate from problem statements because the incumbents do not see them as a problem today. And these are totally new operating models empowered by emerging technologies and new startups that we all should be aware of. I will share an example of the additive manufacturing or some call the 3D printing program that MPA initiated with the National Additive Manufacturing Innovation Cluster in Singapore as well as the Singapore Shipping Association three years ago. 3D printing has potential in many applications including the way we manage ships and ports inventory and ships spare parts. One belief is that shipping companies will soon be able to order selected spare parts on demand, have the digital blueprint delivered over the internet and have them digitally printed and delivered at the next port of call. The first phase of our additive manufacturing joint industry projects was led by DMV together with more than 10 industry partners to study the commercial and technical feasibilities of thousands of marine parts before converging to the top 100 potential ones. In the additive manufacturing JIP phase two this year, we awarded six industry consortiums, including one led by Wilhelmsen Ship Services with 13 industry partners to print and trial 10 different marine parts on their vessels. The additive manufacturing is still an emerging area for maritime, and we have research institutions involved in the R&D phase. I will take the opportunities to highlight that there are four maritime centers of excellence which Norway's maritime and research community can explore collaboration with. They are the Centers for Next Generation Port at NUS, Maritime Energy and Sustainable Development at NTU, the Center for Autonomous and Remote Operations of Vessels at NUS TCOMS, and Center for Maritime Safety at Singapore Polyt Polytechnic. It is useful to note that last October, the Syntef Ocean and NUS TCOMS have jointly published the R&D roadmap for smart and autonomous shipping. It is a kind of R&D collaboration and thought leadership initiative that we hope to see more in the future between Singapore and Norway. 
In the next few slides, I will talk about the avenues which you and your organization could engage more closely with the maritime ecosystem in Singapore. First, on the maritime innovation workshops, MPA and the Singapore Maritime Institute typically kickstart the series of design thinking workshops at the beginning of every year. We broadcast the workshops event via email as well as through our partners. And we welcome all of our Norwegian partners to take part in this design thinking and innovation workshop, which essentially provide free training for the staff in the organizations. The participants that have been active in the last few years include Wilhelmsen, Tome, OSM, Klafnes, and GUT. At the end of these workshops, we expect to deliver about 10 industry challenge statements. These are usually major challenges or opportunities where there are no commercially viable solutions in the market or where a single organization may not have the expertise and resources to address on their own. Next is the Maritime Innovation Playbook and the Digital Acceleration Index. These are guidebooks or compass that you can refer to in helping your organization to kickstart the digital transformation journey or at least have some understanding of what sort of digital transformation we are working towards and where your organization stands today in terms of digital capabilities. The MPA, PSA and Jerome Port have living labs for companies and technology developers to do live trials and experimentation. For example, the PSA has a living lab at the Pasapanjang terminal to facilitate trials with tech developers and researchers. And for MPA's living lab, we have the Kongsberg, ST Engineering, and the A-Star Research Institutions doing working on various R&D projects, including the next generation vessel traffic management concept and future maritime communication system, such as VDES, uh, which John later will talk about it. We have set up the Maritime Drone Estate at the Maritime Marina South Pier that enables drones developers, startups, ship service providers to carry out live trials in the port waters, using drones to move things between ship and shore, do ship inspection or do monitoring of marine incidents, etc. We are also building up a new digital tech marketplace, which essentially is a directory for maritime companies to look up tech developers, providers, and products and solutions, whether in smart ship management, electronic documentation, crew management, crew training, bunker management, agencies, tools, ship supplies, and I will encourage maritime solution and product providers to get registered into the directory, get discovered by potential customers, and let's not reinvent the wheel if there are existing products that can serve the needs in the market. And there are some ongoing initiatives, which I won't go into the details uh, because of time, but I'll just share that digital bunkering, electronic bills or lading, SG Tradex, are more recent public-private partnership initiatives, which we welcome more partners, whether the maritime companies or tech developers to come on board the conversation. Last but not least, MPA and six other founding members, DMV Foundation, BW Group, BHP, Eastern Pacific Shipping, Ocean Network Express, and Samcorp Marine have jointly all announced the establishment of a Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization, or GCMD in short, with a 120 million Singapore dollar funding. The GCMD endeavors to onboard like-minded industry stakeholders to jointly identify and undertake worthwhile decarbonization projects, whether test bathing and trials of alternative marine fuel or developing new bunkering standards. And we look forward to a closer collaboration between Singapore and Norway on this very important subject on maritime decarbonization and sustainability. Thank you. Thanks for the excellent presentation, Thomas. Innovation Norway looks forward to working closely with the MPA on these projects and bring in Norwegian companies with the relevant expertise to participate in these opportunities. Next, we will have Captain John Dion Ervik to give his keynote speech. Captain John Dion Ervik is the Head of Department for Navigation Technology and Pilotage Management in the Norwegian Coastal Administration. The Norwegian Coastal Administration is an advisory and governmental agency of the Ministry of Transport and Communications. It is responsible for safe navigation, 
coastal management and preparedness against acute pollution. This includes aids to navigation, five vessel traffic service centers, LRIT, terrestrial and satellite AIS services, communication technology, digital services such as e-navigation, maritime ITS, and ship reporting single window, as well as autonomous systems. John Leon, please. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you for the uh, invitation. Um, I just want to emphasize before I begin my presentation that uh, uh, we have uh, the Norwegian Coast Administration uh, have cooperated closely with the MPA for, for many years, especially in IMO and uh, IALA. And uh, we really look forward to uh, continue the cooperation with our friends in Singapore as soon as we start to get more back to normal and can, can uh, keep up the good work that we, we have done so far. Can you give me the next slide? Uh, I'm head of the Department for uh, Navigation Technology and Pilotage Management. It's a strange combination, but, but uh, much of what we focus on is on the uh, navigation technology. And then we have the um, uh, uh, pilot authority parts, of course. So uh, this uh, uh, department have the responsibility for the uh, technical solutions that is uh, used and developed in the vessel traffic services. We have the uh, message and reporting system. We have e-navigation, maritime ITS, and uh, uh, maritime uh, uh, autonomous uh, surface ships. Next. I just want to remind uh, everybody, I use, it's not, probably not necessary in this uh, audience, but uh, between Norway and Singapore, but. Uh, this is uh, the largest, oldest uh, transport form, and it's global. Uh, this illustrates how, how we are connected to each other as flag state and coastal states and, and, um, and what we are um, uh, actually a part of large transport of uh, goods and what we need around the globe. Next. And, uh, I will start with the, uh, actually this is the conclusion, but I will start and come back to that and explain a little bit about what I think uh, will be fruitful cooperation between Singapore and Norway. Um, of course, the digitalization, that we will never go back to the analog systems that we have before. We, we move into the digital world and we have a long history, a close cooperation in IMO e-navigation, VDS is coming up, 5G is coming up, and both uh, coastal states and authorities uh, do need uh, new communication solutions to provide information and communicate with the shipping or the seagoing part. Maritime ETS, recognized by politicians. Last week I was in Hamburg in the World ITS Conference and there's over 3,000 people participating. Uh, so. It's almost the same as e-navigation, but it's recognized by the politicians, the ITS. We need user-friendly systems, solutions, maritime safety, efficiency in ports, just-in-time arrival, something that we have already worked together in, enhanced ship reporting, sustainable solutions, that's important in the future, and artificial intelligence and big data solutions. And then we have mass and other autonomous systems. Next. Just to go back a little bit in history, hopefully, but still there is some systems on board that this is the uh, coyote requirement in IMO presently. Uh, for uh, navigation warnings, you have the Navtex receiver. For AIS, you have the keyboard, minimum keyboard display. And then you have a lot of publications. And that's what we try to move away. <coughs> in, this is parts that we have to take into the digital era we are moving into. Next. And we are somewhere between uh, this digital um, world and the, uh, um, the analog world. Uh, we, we, and we will be there for a long time before we have really um, 
made our uh, standards and agreed about the global solutions. And I think that um, Singapore and Norway can play an, a central role in that part. Next. Just, a sh just, just an illustration of the, the uh, elements in e-navigation. We have ship, ship components, we have shore components, we, ha we have uh, uh, the communication components. And in between those, there is uh, uh, overlaps uh, and everything is connected to each other. And I think in all these elements, including the user-driven solutions, I think that uh, Singapore and Norway already have showed the way and we should uh, keep on uh, lead the work and show the way forward in the future. Next. And from our perspective, this is not, not probably something that you face in Singapore, but uh, my idea or uh, view is that we, we, if we solve communication in high north with those uh, difficulties and those challenges that we have there, and we test out uh, VDS solutions, uh, new supply solutions, and other communication solutions in high north, I think you have a different uh, challenges in Singapore. Uh, but if you remember, the transport is global, and Singapore is very central in that global fairway. So if we could cooperate uh, in the communication uh, challenges, I think we can solve issues both for Norway and for Singapore, and also probably give uh, uh, something into the, the global harmonization in IMO and IALA and other organizations. Next. We have already a uh, fruitful cooperation. I just want to mention the uh, Sesame uh, Strait project, uh, where we have a, a, corp a very good cooperation over years. And I think it's, this is just uh, the beginning of what we should uh, uh, continue to work on together. Next. You see what we have done uh, in Singapore, we have also done the same in Norway. We have implemented Re uh, reference routes along the whole coast now, up to Svalbard actually. And uh, the idea now is to, um, uh, you can go in and pick up your uh, your digital routes and put it on the ECTIS and then you will have ad additional information along the route. And it's, uh, of course, you are not interested to have information about, about everything that happened behind you. You are, as you drive in your car, uh, interested to have information about what happened where you are driving. And that's what uh, we uh, will also uh, uh, develop in, in Norway. And there is a, there was a, a IMO paper on this. Once we revise the ECTIS, we should also include uh, an uh, opportunity to include the uh, exchange of digital routes directly to the ECTIS. Um, so we support that and we'll continue to try to uh, achieve that. So the mariner can actually follow the route and get information along the route that will, is important for him, next, for her, next. Back to the principles and ID, uh, in, for instance, the SISAMI project, and also a, a lot of work that we do in Norway, and I think also can be beneficial. Uh, and that's the multimodal part. Uh, there, are, there is a connection between the road, railway, and sea. And 80% of export import in Norway go by sea. So we have to do something with port efficiency. Next. Yeah. And this is also illustrate what I will see, show you on the next slide. And take next, where we coordinate all information into a single window ship reporting. Next. And uh, we also, together with the European Maritime Safety Agency, test this out by using VDS uh, on satellite. Next. 
Okay, uh, the time is running, so I will uh, I will just say that we uh, we can increase the uh, situation awareness by taking into account digitalization next. And that's why we also build up something called Bean, where we want to discover or we, we want to use big data, artificial intelligence in the WTS to discover uh, uh, small abnormalities that is not uh, the human eye cannot discover and, uh, and use that as a, as a tool in the WTS. And I think we can also uh, work on this together with Singapore. Next. Here you can see an example where we, this system, discover one vessel who is not normal behavior. It's far out of what we, what the big data tell us is normal. Next. Yeah, at least, at, at, and in the end, uh, this, all this will end up as uh, solutions for uh, autonomous systems. You can just roll through the next. And I think there is some similarities between Singapore and Norway, where you can utilize the seaways instead of uh, traffic jam, and you can use it sust sustainable and autonomous. Next. Yeah, next. And we have a test area in uh, several test areas in Norway, and this is right outside my office, where we start to test out autonomous uh, uh, vessels. Next. So I don't need to, to uh, re read a conclusion because that was also my starting of the start of the presentation. Uh, so this is the conclusion. Uh, if anybody asks me uh, about uh, what we can cooperate and what is the similarities between Singapore and Norway and the fruitful cooperation, uh, this is from my point of view, uh, important uh, bullet points that can be included in a future cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, John Leon. Great presentation and thanks for putting the cooperation between Singapore and Norway into context. Indeed, there was and continue to be several areas of collaboration between the two countries, including maritime communication, as you have suggested. We shall now bring Thomas back to answer questions from the floor. Okay, since we are, we'll be having a panel discussion on maritime communication later, can I start by asking Thomas, how does communication technology such as 5G or VDES fit into some of the high level strategies of the MPA? Can you please enlighten us on this? Yeah, I'm not a communication expert, uh, but I will share briefly on what uh, we have been doing over the years uh, with regards to communication. I think firstly, uh, the 4G and 5G, as you compare to the uh, VDES and EIS, they, they have a slightly different uh, scope of applications. Uh, when we look at the VHF data exchange systems, um, this is developed together with the international merit, uh, maritime community. We are looking at uh, more satisfying the uh, international uh, regulatory and safety uh, vessel traffic related uh, applications. So I would say that between ship and ship, ship to shore kind of reporting applications, VDES will be the one that uh, we have to harmonize across international uh, community. Uh, in the case of the 5G and 4G, uh, we are exploring the different applications. It's always a chicken and egg. I mean, if you don't uh, put in the infrastructure, the applications will never come. But of course, the businesses will also tell you, show me the value propositions of investing into the 5G infrastructure. So what we do is actually we start with some small use cases, putting in some of the, um, for instance, the Maritime Jones Estate. Uh, we'll be putting in uh, some of the advanced communication technology to allow the drone to do more advanced uh, screening of the, the video streaming in terms of the port situations, you know, piping some of this information back. Uh, but 5G is not for every application uh, because um, only if you have a very heavy data bandwidth requirement, have very stringent latency requirements, uh, then 5G be useful, which otherwise 5G, essentially the technology today, the range is very limited. I mean, it's much worse than 4G. So, so in terms of the coverage, we have to think about how do we cover the entire port waters using uh, 5G. 
And the 4G today still serves a lot of the applications. So the question is how do we then extend the usability, enhance the 5, 4G coverage such that we can enable as many of the applications. So maybe I just share briefly on, on that. Hmm. Thank, thank you, Thomas. Uh, John Dion, do you have anything to add on 5G VDES technology? No, uh, uh, I think we, we <laughs> so most of the time we, we are online with, uh, with Singapore and uh, we have the same challenges. We, we recognize that, I recognize that all the way that we have the same challenge. I can probably, I, I often say that um, for me, it's important that uh, the postman who deliver the message uh, deliver. Uh, and we still need to figure out what uh, we need the VDS for, what kind, what is the capacity, what will be um, the quality, and also 5G. We know that uh, 4G, 5G will, will deliver have to be connected to the right systems and so on. So we can benefit from it, from the authority side and also from the user side. Uh, back to the postman, um, the postman will change. The postman, there will always be new, new systems. Uh, we, we only want to be the one who, who uh, use the system as best suitable for the solutions that we need to solve. Thanks for the comment. I think this sets us up very nicely for the panel discussion to follow, which will be on the maritime communication future possibilities. Um, we have one question from the floor. I think it comes from uh, Phoebe Lim. Uh, the, the question is uh, whether MPA is able to share the top 100 additive uh, manufacturing uh, list of ma uh, additive manufacturing for marine parts. Is, is, is there such a list available? <coughs> Yeah, so the phase one report uh, has been published on MP and uh, the Singapore Shipping Association websites since uh, last year, I think. So you can actually access the, the report to find out the, the 100 parts that uh, these consortiums uh, they have put together that make an assessment on the commercial and technical feasibilities, uh, commercial to a large extent and technical to some extent. And uh, to your question, the phase two is currently underway because the project uh, was just awarded to the six industry consortiums. And uh, basically they have printed up some of the parts, they're gonna do some testing. Uh, some of these will go through the, the classification uh, approval as well. And then they will install on their ships and be tested. So there's no reports from there, but there are consortiums uh, working on it, six consortiums. Thank you, thank you for answering that, uh, Thomas. Um, with, with this note, um, we will be moving on to our next uh, session. I'd like to thank Thomas and John Leon for sharing the valuable information and perspectives. These are indeed exciting times for the maritime industry, and there are good opportunities for maritime startups and solution providers from both Singapore and Norway to participate in. We shall now move on to a, have a panel discussion on the future possibilities of maritime communication. Just as an introduction to this panel discussion, maritime communication is one of the key enab enablers in the maritime industry, and the technology has been innovating over the course of history. From the early days of using Morse code signals to telegraph, to short-range radio frequencies, and then to satellite communication, vessels today are generating and transmitting an ever-increasing volume of data. A study by Vodafone showed that the average data transfer per month per vessel between shore and ship is 50 gigabyte. Much more data and bandwidth are required as vessels digitalize more of their operations and processes. In the panel today, we shall focus the discussion on the future possibilities of maritime communication in the context of two new developments, VHF data exchange system, VDES, uh, and 5G networks. 5G will provide more speed ca capacity and lower latency to the maritime industry VDES has 32 times more bandwidth than the current AIS system. It can support increased communication requirements and enables a wider, a wider seamless data exchange for e-navigation. With the combination of 5G and VDES, this will boost maritime communication capabilities, which will enable other technologies such as remote operations and autonomous shipping. We are very honored to have four outstanding subject matter experts from both Singapore and Norwegian organizations to provide us insights into this topic. 
one of the strong industry advocates for the greater use of data and an open innovation philosophy to solve maritime challenges is Mr. Naku Mahotra, Vice President, Open Innovation, Wilhelmson Ship Service, or WSS in short. WSS is a provider of several marine solutions serving over half of the global merchant fleet with their products and services and can deliver to more than 2,200 ports in 125 countries. They are developing new and daring solutions to shape the future of the maritime industry. NACU combines a wealth of 25 years in international maritime commercial operations and management experience with qualifications in marine engineering business management and has direct seafaring experience. Space Norway, a Norwegian government-owned organization, is one of the front runners in the VDES technology. And with us is Mr. Hans Christian Hockley, Head of Innovation and Development at Space Norway. In 2017, Space Norway launched the satellite NORSAT-2, which had a VDES software-defined radio payload, which was used to test and demonstrate VDES. Hans has developed mobile satellite communications for more than 30 years in other organizations, such as the European Space Agency and IMASAT. He was also previously the Director of Research and Innovation at Telenor. And to bring 5G and VDES into context and to enlighten us more on the ongoing research and development of these technologies, we have Dr. Francois Chin, Head of Satellite Aviation and Maritime at Agency for Science, Technology and Research, or ASTAR. ASTAR is a statutory board under the Ministry of Trade and Industry of Singapore. The agency supports R&D that is aligned to areas of competitive advantage and national needs for Singapore. Since 1995, Francois has been with the Institute for Infocom Research at ASTAR, where he has led numerous R&D teams in future broadband wireless access technologies. He is also the program head of the 5G and Beyond program. Lastly, research and development efforts must be grounded and relevant to the end users of the technology, and any new technology needs to be adopted by a critical mass of end users to achieve the necessary skill. To share with us on the perspective of the end users, we have met Mr. Peter Schellenberger, Vice President for Global Supply Chain of Tume Ship Management, which is a Singapore-based Norwegian ship manager with 450 vessels under management and a crew pool of more than 12,000. Tume is one of the top 10 most important ship management companies globally. Peter started his maritime career here in Singapore, where he formerly managed two leading ship handling companies before joining the V Group to head supply chain, as well as Marcus Asia, Maritime Service Business Development and the Global Agency Portfolio. He was also formerly Managing Director in OSM and was responsible in creating OSERF, a digital e-procurement platform for fleet and third-party clients. So good afternoon, gentlemen, and thank you all for taking time off your very busy schedule for this panel discussion. We hope through this uh, panel discussion, there will be more understanding and industry interest on maritime communication technologies. For those watching, please feel free to put in your questions in the Q&A functions. We will post some of these questions to the panelists towards the later part of the panel discussion. Hey, Naku, um, we shall start off with you first. Um, data has been described as the new oil. Can you please start us off by telling us why data in the maritime sector is valuable? Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much. First of all, let me just say, you know, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to the session and I saw some of the other sessions and um, definitely inspiring and, and thought provoking in, in many different ways. Um, data is the new oil. It was the cover of, of a magazine, I guess, um, a while ago. And a lot of people refer to it. Um, let me say that uh, data augmented decision making is never a bad thing. Uh, the more information you have, the better your the quality of decisions you can make. And I think data supporting uh, areas uh, such as safety, uh, operational optimization, um, you know, behavioral changes so that you're working towards a safer, greener, smarter, and so on and so forth. Uh, industry is always a good thing. So I think, you know, why data is, is important isn't really the crux of the question, if I can say that, Daniel. The crux of the question is there's a lot of discussion and debate around data ownership. And, and my personal view is um, it isn't so much the ownership of the data, but actually rights of access. And I think if we, if we shift our discussion and shift our mindset to not who owns it, but actually who can use it 
to produce something even more valuable. I think that's one thing that I would start off with. Uh, the second thing is that if we continue with the analogy of data as the new oil, then um, I would propound really useful to think about, is it the crude oil or the finished product that is more valuable? And is it the refining process that might be um, an area that we want to focus on as well? So I think if we continue that analogy and recognize the value chain of um, extraction, the value chain of refining, the value chain of producing um, refined products, and then and then try to figure out where in that value chain are individual organizations best placed. Uh, also trying to think about whether organizations are best placed to consume the output or actually contributing and creating a more valuable output. I think those are some of the questions that I would, I would put forward um, and some of the areas of thinking. Data is important, no brainer. What kind of data and what you wanna do with it is something that I think is, is definitely uh, worth considering very carefully. Thank you, Naku, for that. It's a very good uh, a reminder and a mindset shift. I guess we can do, um, we can look at the ownership of data, who can use the data, and also um, data as a finished uh, product. And I, I shall now move my attention to um, uh, Francois, uh, who is uh, doing a lot of uh, research in uh, maritime communication. So perhaps uh, I did not do uh, justice to his team in the, during the introduction. So maybe, may I can, maybe I can ask him to share more with us on his uh, areas of research and interest. Francois, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I just want to touch base basically in, in my research organization, uh, uh, two teams. One team is more in the maritime uh, comms research specifically uh, doing VDES. And this, we are covering both terrestrial VDES as well as satellite VDES. Okay, in the terrestrial VDES, we are, um, in, in the system itself, we are looking at uh, ways to tackling the issues of uh, uh, multiple propagation uh, effect uh, in the um, marine time communication. So basically, as you know, um, in the propagation channel, you have a direct line of sight. At the same time, you have those reflected away from the water surface. So this will bring, this will give rise to destructive uh, 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 and constructive uh, interference such that the, you have fadings along, along the line. So we are working on the equalizer aspect of this terrestrial uh, VDES. Uh, as for the satellite VDES, as you know, the VDES, uh, satellite VDES itself uh, provide a huge coverage, uh, it covers, under the field of view, you have many, many vessels. So in those cases, um, one, one of the challenges is that the, let's say when the vessels send out the packets, uh, some of these packets are uh, asynchronous, therefore there may be a lot of uh, collisions. So we are working on algorithms that we can uh, decouple, decollate the packets so that we can still sustain the huge amount of vessels under the coverage within uh, one single satellite. Okay. As for the um, the the others, the other group that I'm leading is actually on the five G and beyond program. So in this uh, program, in this program itself, we aim to innovate and develop new technologies that contribute towards a more resilient and trusted five G networks that support use cases that in line with the Singapore Smart Nation and Digital Economy priorities. And some of these use cases are smart cities, urban solution, advanced manufacturing, a part of futures. So um, in the, uh, and currently some of the areas that we are focusing our research efforts are enhanced uh, 5G uplink, downlink throughput through the use of carrier aggregation. We also have, uh, um, a 5G modem customized for industrial applications, especially drones. Uh, we use you know, uh, video analytics for smart urban solutions. We are also looking into the cyber security aspect, um, especially uh, when we use 5G for various use cases. Uh, we do network slicing. Basically, it's an area where we want to meet the requirements of different applications, uh, that, that, that could be prioritizing uh, high data rate or low latency. 
or even both. So um, in, in this aspect, we are also currently looking into using 5G for uh, covering the ports, especially extending, extending the idea of time-sensitive network over a wide area for coverage of a large campus area, uh, like, like port uh, coverage. So that is some of the areas that we are working right now. Thank you. Thank you for sharing us, uh, sharing with us, uh, uh, Francois. I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, areas of collaboration, potentially with the industry players for 5G and VDES technology. Now, moving on to Hans. Uh, Hans, you are the expert in uh, VDES. So maybe you can you know, um, enlighten us about this uh, VDES technology in a simple and concise way. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, VDS is a very new two-way digital communication standard. Uh, it's still in a, in a test phase in terms of uh, we have been doing a number of tests and there are various aspects which are getting in tuning and tweaking to get it better. To say it simply, uh, it's, a, it's the postman that uh, Captain Eric was talking about mm. and the postman has two routes. He has terrestrial route where you have perhaps up to a few hundred kilobits per second we're direct between ship and shore. And you have the satellite route, which is a much lower rate and it's the store and forward. So in for the satellite route, you have to wait for the satellite to fly over and then you can deliver perhaps between two and 20 or 50 kilobits per second of data. So it's like a store and forward system. Uh, we have been quite active in the Ally group together with the Kongsberg CTEX and Norwegian Coastal Administration. And that has resulted in two satellites Sorry, one satellite up there by the, owned by the Norwegian Space Agency. And there is a second satellite to be launched uh, next year, which then will provide additional capacity because one satellite will typically give you coverage for a period of about 10 to 11 minutes. And a satellite will fly over you depending on where you are every, every 100 minutes or even more infrequent if, if you are far from the, the orbit plane. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a low rate system in many ways, uh, satellite part is storm forward. I think the advantage is it's uh, basically an upgrade to AIS, so you mm. can replace existing uh, AIS equipment, reuse the antennas, power supplies, and bridge integration, and then get additional services. Perhaps from a coastal administration point of view, uh, the coastal administration who's developed and invented the VDS system has the full control over, over the communication path. So for example, they can decide where they put their base stations to provide coverage, they can decide how many satellites they would want in the future, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a system they have control and that should possibly improve security in that you have control of all aspects of the system. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Yeah, it's a very clear explanation. And I think that that, that will make the uh, postman job uh, uh, very uh, efficient and effective going forward with uh, BDES uh, technology. Um, I'll move on to Peter. Peter, coming from the ship management perspective uh, and hearing these uh, developments, uh, what excites you uh, about these uh, uh, new developments in marine time communications? Well, first of all, I, I think uh, the exciting thing is that for years we have spoken about the digitization and, and these advancements, and now the technical solutions are there. Uh, so that is the big difference. Uh, mm. We've been dreaming about a lot of things and we wanted to get closer to what I would call real life. So the maritime industry has always been lagging behind. Mm. Uh, and and uh, that is, of course, uh, particularly driven uh, also by cost. So uh, it was simply in the past. Uh, if I look back about four or five years ago, uh, as a major ship manager, we were lucky if we had a 60% VSAT coverage on our, on our vessels, uh, linked to the owners, of course, who have to pay the bills for it. And, and we, we now have managed an understanding because we have meaningful applications that are monetizable and mm -hmm. they, they have an impact on OPEX and, and uh, safe uh, management of the vessels. And uh, that results in uh, a share of about 95% VSAT connections, which is then again, the enabler for us to look into optimization uh, into smart uh, tools that help us run and optimize uh, uh, vessel operations, right? So uh, it is really the coming, the come becoming a, to be a reality of our daily life. Um, and, and now the biggest enemy is basically legacy and mindset so that we, we are really starting to implement this 
uh, in, into our operations and uh, show real um, uh, operational benefits, not only to our internal organization, that is the first point of sale, if you like, but then, of course, filtering through to the ship owners and, and uh, the organizations that own vessels that are they're no longer necessarily uh, the former traditional ship owners is more often than not financial organizations and funds, and they have a completely different need also for uh, data usage uh, and, and the results of our data crunching. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, I, I want to stick with you uh, again uh, for the next question. It's uh, what are the current limitations for maritime communications and what are the pain points? for ship managers? Okay, uh, I, I think um, it very often comes down to cost, I would say. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of smart um, products that are being developed that not only depend on the uh, main connection of the vessel ship to shore. And, and uh, we're talking about uh, effects of like say, edge computing. So where we have a lot of processing of data uh, uh, on the vessels themselves, which in, in turn, also uh, um, requires certain investments in vessel hardware. Yeah? If, you, if you would look at some of the vessels or many of the vessels, uh, you, you, ha you have situations that are 10, 15 years old, you know, with, with windows unpatched. Mm -hmm. So the step to, to a, a real uh, professionally managed IT environment is absolutely important for us as a ship manager. We have to, and that's also a challenge, we have to basically fight through with our various owners uh, and some of them are very inclined and others not so much uh, that we have to create minimum standards to enable professional management of their vessels right mm -hmm. and and uh, you would be really terrified if you would see how little the willingness is to learn also from painful experience you know i, I want to uh, just have a side uh, excursion into cybersecurity. Everybody mm. was aware of the of the of the very costly things that have happened to uh, companies that were affected by 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 attacks. But then still today, uh, the the the, uh, the likelihood for for owners to uh, preventatively pay for for subscriptions to protect the A to Z, not only the connection ship to shore, but the whole uh, ecosystem, including. Uh, the uh, the, co the uh, infrastructure on board and also protect against uh, the 70 percent source of problems uh, which means uh, crew intervention and crew training is very low yeah so a lot of people are simply taking risks and saying oh, if it then happens I'll deal with it mm -hmm. uh, but uh, slowly slowly uh, I say with uh, with a lot of satisfaction it is changing mm -hmm. but uh, enablers um, uh, are totally necessary because we have so many things that we want to do uh, in terms of predictive things, in terms of uh, analytics. Uh, we want to uh, give um, uh, good benefits, not only to the owners that are, that are our direct clients, but also to charters uh, and, and uh, its voyage optimization and things like that. So these are things that traditional ship managers never have, never have looked into, but uh, we, we have to look at the final end result and that is uh, a, a commercial success in running vessels safely and uh, and efficiently, right? So uh, all new tools that are coming our way, and this is why I'm, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, a lot of those tools are being co-developed um, by Norwegian mm. companies, or they're active in there. And uh, and of course, there's a good reason why why this session here is in Singapore, because probably we are we are in a maritime environment which is mm. the most advanced globally. I would dare, dare to say, with um, uh, also government uh, organizations that work together uh, to uh, accelerate uh, and, and, uh, and, and find ways uh, for, for business propositions, right? So that's quite unique. And we're right in the middle of that. And uh, as a ship manager, we have to, I think the best thing that we can do is to provide a platform for proof of concepts, mm -hmm. because that is generally the biggest enemy of new ideas, mm -hmm. uh, that they sound great uh, and on paper they look good. But uh, uh, the devil's in the detail. So uh, I, I'm proud to say that we are one of the organizations who, who are quite open when we see uh, a, a use case, either for safety, uh, commercial gain, uh, or, or better operations or crew safety, uh, then, then we are quite happy uh, to, to open our, uh, our uh, proof, of co proof of concept function functionalities, not only for startups, but also for mature organizations. Thank you, uh, Peter. 
So I get that the we need to modernize the IT systems in the vessels. Yes. Uh, VDES 5G uh, will bring promising uh, 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 innovations, but there are also challenges such as cyber security. I think that that is another big topic. Um, and um, and also, um, I, I guess the the other thing will be cost, as you as you mentioned. Yeah. So I think for for ship owners, the cost is always on their mind. Um, I I would like to now ask uh, uh, Naku. So uh, having here, you know, Peter as uh, you know potential uh, end customers uh, saying this, uh, what what kind of uh, projects is in uh, in your mind? What do you think would be you know some of the uh, solutions that can be uh, provided for to ship owners and ship managers in the in these areas. So I think there's a number of different areas, but I think you know let, let's um, just to contextualize uh, sort of in relationship to to the two topics that you want to focus on VDES and and 5G. I think ultimately 5G and VDES are 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 really um, connectivity or communication pipe platforms that 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 have functions uh, or that are being targeted um, for particular purposes. Let's say given given their individual characteristics, and like that, uh, you know there are existing pipes, and and more more than likely uh, there will be a number of different different, um, let's say, I don't want to call them competing, but at least different alternatives for, for a while. Um, and in that transition, it's going to be a lot based on exactly what you want to uh, focus on, what kind of outcome. So I think from our, from our perspective, um, you know, we, we obviously are focusing on um, um, technologies such as IoT and so on and so forth that, that help the monitoring and control of different equipments and, and um, uh, functions on board the ship. Now that is going to need some sort of a communication platform. At the same time, um, we're very active in, in the startup space and, and I, um, given some of the work that I do with Maritime VCs, um, see a lot of allocation of capital and a lot of activity around, let's say, optimizing port efficiency and port um, effectiveness. And so when, when we're seeing that kind of capital and activity focusing over there and we're seeing this confluence of talent and we're seeing interest from other industries uh, looking at that place, uh, what we see is that there's a real need for fast tracking the foundation of the communication platform in the port level. And that's where I think, you know, 5G comes in very, very obviously because um, Peter mentioned, you know, Maritime being stuck sort of in the past and trying to catch up. I mean, it's a time machine here we're in. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, we operate in the 21st century where we're all exposed to 5G uh, capable solutions. And then Monday morning, we come back to, you know, it's like 1999. Uh, we have to come back to this, the sort of restrictions uh, that we're operating in. And so, so <clears throat> a lot of the uh, interest that is now, particularly because of decarbonization, port optimization and supply chain resilience, big topics for other industries, but fundamental to our industry, when you see that interest coming from those other industries, they assume a standard, right? They assume that what they've done with their smart factories, what they've done with the sort of other parts of the supply chain can be applied here. And the reality is it can't. So for, I think in that context, um, it's, it's not like, you know, we're going to develop 5G solutions in, in and of itself. But the partners that we work with and the solutions that we want to offer will need that capability mm. on the port side. And similarly, I think VDES has a very uh, particular potential application, particularly with regards to uh, safety and the security that, that um, Hans explained uh, a, little bit, a little bit earlier as well. And I think, again, it's about enhancing that capability. Ultimately, um, connectivity is the fundamental enabler of networked systems, and and so uh, you know, it's it's um, it's almost like a, it's no longer a nice to have; it's a need to have, and we need mm -hmm. to we need to get there to be able to enable it. And I think I'll use the analogy. So you know, specifics on IoT solutions, specifics on you know, three D printing, all of the data flows that that you can imagine are predicated on these on these solutions. But I'll give the analogy of think about what happened in the nineties and the two thousands and leading up to, let's say, the 20, late 2010s, when the rest of the planet moved from 2G to 5G, mm. it unleashed so much opportunity in terms of video streaming, in terms of um, network 
uh, you know, social networks, in terms of uh, sharing of information, in terms of uh, training solutions, in terms of um, being able to monitor and control machinery remotely. That analogy exists over here as well. So if we can get our ships and ports migrating from wherever they are now, some ports are, I would argue, are still sitting at the 2G stage um, and uh, in the world, and some are moving, obviously, much more. If you can move that migration, we get to unleash all of those opportunities in the same way. Uh, we get to bring our time machine back to 2021. Hmm. Thanks for that thought. Um, and I, I would like to now ask Hans. Uh, okay, so um, the... Uh, VDES technology um, it has been mentioned that uh, uh, is used for marine time safety. Uh, is there any other areas where uh, VDES can potentially be used in? Oh well, yes, I think it's, I don't think we have in, in imagined all the possible areas. Uh, so we have the broadcasting function, which can be used to distribute all kind of information very very effectively, whether it's weather maps, size chart, maritime safety information, charter tests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we have a test now going on, uh, just just about to start from the Norwegian Coastal Administration to broadcast ice sharks uh, for the Arctic region. Mm. And with the opening of the perhaps the modern route, that's mm. an area which can become quite quite important. Uh, also, together with the Norwegian Coastal Administration, we are demonstrating and uh, testing out a new search and rescue application where we uh, will basically distribute. Uh, search patterns directly from the rescue coordination center. We won't get them directly into ship computer yet, but we are on the step to get the search patterns into the ship computer. And also the ship will report back where it's actually searched, even if you are not within the AI satellite coverage. So we, you can basically ask a ship to search particular patterns. You can then get information back at the rescue coordination center to what actually happened. And you can look at the difference. You know where you have been searched. The third uh, service we are about to test it with Norwegian Coastal Administration and the European Maritime Safety Agency is harbor reporting. Uh, so that's a two-way service. We will basically report to harbor, mandatory information to enable a, a much more smoother port operation. But this is just the beginning. We have also tested, for example, uh, rebroadcasting of AIS position in the Arctic. This has been used by a vessel which went to the North Pole. So you can see what vessels are in the neighborhood. You could see uh, basically a uh, track there used by a Russian icebreaker so they could get to North Pole in a week from the Svalbard Islands. So you know what is happening. Uh, similarly, we have a new activity on the go where we will uh, test out what we call the precision time service or VDS. We think that can be used to enhance or perhaps give information about your navigation system board, a secondary way to verify your navigation system. We are aware of spoofing or, or GPS, etc. So there are different methods to, to do that. We have a lot of interest in IoT, and it's slowly going up, but we think the drive for VDS initially will be the, the 16 maritime uh, services that I am defined and Captain Lerick showed on one of his very first slides. But it's really up to the industry to, to work with us and say, okay, what are the important services? I mentioned the three first ones we are starting, but obviously we're open for more and more cooperation. We're putting up, as I mentioned, a second satellite. Uh, however, if you want a good service uh, around the world, you need more than two satellites. And these satellites mm -hmm. being low cost, only have a lifetime perhaps of five years. And the first satellite was launched in 2017. So even though we hope to get a bit more than five years out of it, uh, you know, clearly this is an issue which needs to be addressed. My view is that the infrastructure has to come first and then we'll get the service when the infrastructure is there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. It sounds like there is uh, much more to explore with uh, VDES and it's also exciting that you're launching the uh, second satellite as well. And I, I believe you mentioned also, um, you know, potential collaboration with uh, Singapore on uh, 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 sharing the satellite. Maybe you can also elaborate on that. Uh, yes. Uh, I spent many years with Inmarsat and uh, what I saw in those days when were in the intergovernmental organization was that the model where different countries can contribute with their assets, for example, if they have a space asset, Perhaps it's a way that, you know, if Singapore puts a satellite in a, in a polar orbit, we can share that with the most likely Norwegian satellite in, uh, sorry, in, in Arctic orbits. And then you can basically share capacity and perhaps you can share some infrastructure. So there's a potential here to put up a common infrastructure, because I think the overall global service 
would be much better than if you do it internationally in a cooperative manner rather than each country does it on its own. It's much more complicated. And I think Triala, we have a lot of cooperation and there are good, good relations there. So this makes it possible if people want. So from, from a Norwegian point of view, or at least a Space Norway point of view, we are very open to cooperation and to make it a win-win type of situation. And we probably will be willing to share capacity with others who share capacity with us. And perhaps you could start there. That's a good suggestion, Hans. I, I believe that uh, we, we could uh, talk more about this after the conference as well. I yes. would like to now ask uh, Francois a little bit about 5G. Uh, how, how about the uh, 5G for uh, applications in maritime communications? Can you share with us some of the uh, possibilities here? Uh, yes. Um, as you know, 5G um, is quite different from its previous so in terms of uh, much higher data rate, uh, lower latency, and it can support massive number of uh, IoT devices within that area. So one area uh, which I think is definitely um, useful would be to support um, this um, coastal area drone application mm -hmm. where you can actually um, leverage on the uh, the high data rate, you know, for, for high definition video maneuver, as well as uh, teleoperation of the drone, okay, using uh, leveraging on the low latency, ultra reliable link of the 5G. And that also uh, can enable uh, definitely autonomous uh, uh, vehicle uh, operation. And another important, I think, application of this will be for the port operation to improve the uh, efficiency, the operation efficiency. For instance, uh, with the 5G, uh, you can actually now um, coordinate the, the movements of uh, a lot of AGVs. Uh, you can uh, do driverless crane operation, uh, vehicles operation. Th those are uh, enormous opportunity and uh, uh, future-looking applications that uh, can be enabled by 5G. Thank you. And on the point of uh, drones, um, I believe that uh, Tumi is, uh, uh, has uh, several ongoing uh, research projects on drones. Maybe Peter can share with us more in this yeah, area. That is, that is correct. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting and necessary expansion of our normal supply chain setup, you know, and that is uh, also our biggest challenge. Uh, how, how do you implement uh, these kind of things? And that's, by the way, exactly the same as, as the 3D printing program that we are running uh, uh, gladly with, with the Wilhelmsen organization, right? So um, the, the technical effects are on the table. The, 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 the issue is always, how do you implement that into your uh, system? How do you... Um, convince your internal stakeholders that this is uh, of, of advantage. Initially, some of these uh, things are not obviously cheaper, uh, which is very often a focus, but they're better. Yeah. Uh, so for 3D mm -hmm. printing, for example, we have, to, uh, we have to start with a simple fact, okay, we concentrate on parts that are no longer available or have a very long lead time. You know, everybody understands that this should be printed no matter what the price is. So these are the kind of things that you have to communicate internally. For drones, um, I have to say that even though Singapore is a very open environment, one of our biggest challenges were regulatory challenges. So we were trying, when we were trying to do our first uh, drop test uh, as a proof of concept again, um, it was during the time of the uh, national holidays, you know, and, and the airspace was simply closed for three weeks. So it, it is, um, I, unless this is being tackled, it's very hard to implement this as a, as a normal part of a supply chain uh, uh, w when you're not sure whether it will work or not for these kind of reasons, right? So the smart drone operators of today, they have a backup functionality. If the, if the drone cannot fly, they have on standby a barge that can go. It, it sounds low tech, but it actually solves at least a problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, if we look at uh, other technologies that are really have, have a massive positive impact on the ground, also with the all important crew welfare, welfare thinking is uh, telemedicine. Uh, that is something that will have 
a massive impact on our life and the future also on board. Uh, and it will pull a lot of things with them. Uh, if you look at the medical chests on board, you know, they have been designed 25, 30 years ago, uh, where uh, communication with doctors on site were not possible. You know, nowadays you have, uh, uh, you can have 24 seven specialists consulting the people on board. And of course it opens a, a lot of new possibilities, not only for an, an, an analytics, but also treatment. So this industry is very slow in reacting to these kind of opportunities. So that, that means we as the stakeholders that, that adapt the technologies have to exercise more, more pressure. And we also have to team up with our peers and our suppliers. It's a different uh, relationship or partnership, I would say. And then Nakul is, is living, living proof of that. You know, we work very closely. And a lot of competitors nowadays work very closely with each other in the subject matter environment, you know, because if we want to change something, we have to create what mm -hmm. I call the wave. Uh, we are a me too industry and nobody wants to be generally the first mover ex except for some very few examples that pop up in the media all the time. But if we are looking for new concepts, we have to have, uh, I, I would say, seven or eight credible players and probably 2,000, 2,500 vessels in our portfolio together and then do good things and talk about them. That is the old saying and it's so true, you know, and then we can create the wave that will probably enable us uh, to standardize uh, and to make the rest of the market think uh, and really uh, also later on enable uh, the, uh, the authorities to create the regulatory environment that we need to operate safely. Yeah, so these are the things that uh, uh, are keeping us busy on the ground, really. Mm, yeah, sounds exciting and sounds uh, very, uh, like there's a lot of uh, projects ongoing. Yeah, I have to and, say also uh, uh, MPA, of course, is mm. extremely helpful there uh, also to create the link to other government agencies. So now, uh, of course, we've been linked up with Jurong Ports to see mm. how, how can we bring the port efficiencies in there, in, in this, particularly in the supply chain environment. Uh, there's, there's grants out there that may help us to develop much faster. So uh, one thing is clear, uh, who is not uh, joining the digitization train now, will be left behind at the station. You know, in, in, in the past it was a luxury, now it will be a matter of survival. So uh, it, it will it will separate uh, the men from the boys. Okay. And that in, in the next two or three years, that's my prediction. Yep. Thanks for that stark reminder. Um, I would also like to ask, uh, post this to uh, Naku. Um, just now, uh, Peter has mentioned about uh, open innovation, uh, the, you know, have the need to work with uh, many parties. And uh, I, I would like to understand a bit more about your uh, Wilhelmson. Uh, how does Wilhelmson collaborate with other organizations and startups for open innovation uh, projects? Uh, can you give us an idea since there are many companies here to, today and they might like to see how they would, uh, would be able to cooperate with Wilhelmson? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I think um, just, you know, l let me start with what, what, what Peter ended with. And I think, you know, uh, just coincidentally, I have a LinkedIn post out yesterday talking about mm -hmm. exactly this. Um, the, this. This concept of understanding that, uh, you know, we got to jump onto the digitalization train and so on and so forth is, is happening more and more. And I think as, a, as an industry, uh, we are now at that cusp where we've been very used to any innovation being a reaction to regulation. And so, there, you know, there's a big part of the industry that sort of is saying, all right, we need to have that international regulation in place and then we will respond to it because we have no choice, we have to, right? But we're on the cusp of this changing because quite honestly, regulators themselves, and we've seen some great examples both in Norway and in Singapore uh, with the respective agencies of regulatory sandboxing uh, because the innovation now is moving at a pace where it's actually quite difficult even for regulators to put in place regulations trying to forecast what direction the innovation is going to take. So this, this concept of regulatory sandboxing is extremely important important so that we can we can find safe zones and safe places to to actually trial it not only with suppliers of solutions and consumers of solutions but also with the regulators and for the maritime industry that's really really important um, when you're at the cusp of that sort of change what is likely going to evolve is is that um, the standards will come in as a consequence of adoption rather than a consequence of regulation and therefore, I think this 
testing and trialing and, and all of those safe zones are so important because you get those early adopters. Peter talked about the 2000 vessel mark. That's that's kind of my uh, my view as well. And and I think I think you know uh, once you have that, you have some level of adoption, and you get more and more people adopting on the basis that the solution makes sense, which therefore then becomes a standard, not as a consequence of legislation, but as a consequence of good business case or good business mm. sense, um, probably. And I think that's going to underpin it. And then there will be elements because of the regulatory sandboxing that, that regulators need to come in and, and perhaps create some ring fences around. From a Williamson perspective, look, it's a long journey. Uh, we started our journey in 2015. And I think I think this journey of, of learning uh, is predicated by a number of decision points. The first decision point uh, for us was recognizing and understanding and being honest that we don't have all of the answers and we can't make all of the solutions ourselves. So we need to work within, um, it's, it's, a, it's a Henry Chesborough model for open innovation. It's with permeable organizational boundaries. It's, it's so that we enable spin-ins and spin-outs and so that we can learn and work together uh, with others in both equity and non-equity partnerships. And I think mm. that's important as well, uh, finding simple frameworks. And I think also the second um, mindset shift or really good understanding is, are you working, are you working because you're looking to consume a solution for a problem you have now and therefore you want the solution now, that'll influence the TRL level of who you're engaging with and it has a more procurement view on it actually rather than a co-creation view? Or are you truly looking for a co-creation setup um, where where you know you understand that that solution isn't going to solve your problem today and there's going to be many problems along the way and, and things that have to be navigated but you ultimately want to truly co-create i think one of the big challenges um with corporates working with startups and i speak a lot about this is really corporates having saying they want to co-create and then and then putting these requirements that you know the startup can only exclusively work with that corporate it's that doesn't mean you're co-creating, right? You can't. That's a startup killer. Mm -hmm. And therefore, then the next part is is really having the frameworks around um, simple NDAs, simple documentation, so that you can engage with startups and work with them very quickly and very early. If you predicate it with hundreds of pages of lawyer, um, you know, sort of clauses, you've exhausted the entire startup funding runway trying to sign a contract. So I think there's a big mindset shift around that. I think you know, big legacy corporates are geared towards governing for risk. Startups are geared towards governing for growth. And these two worlds, when they collide, you need some sort of an interpreter in between. I think that's that's the real first point here. And so um, I, I sort of like to refer to a designation called intrapreneur. You need a champion or somebody within the corporate landscape that can navigate all of this to assist working with the startup if you truly want to go down that route. Um, I think I think the other element is as well is just, just to be open and recognize that just as much as you're providing good quality corporate assets, um, knowledge, um, customer relations, um, information, domain expertise, uh, port locations, whatever, just as much as you're providing that, you also have to be open to learn from the startup on new and daring and nimble and agile solutions, which will challenge a lot of assumptions. Everything that corporates have done till now to get to leading positions isn't necessarily a rinse and repeat formula. You might need to change some of those fundamental assumptions as the world around us changes. And I think Open innovation has lots and lots of different stages. I mean, we've called it as a function. Very honestly, when, when my title had open innovation, it was a, an icebreaker. It was a conversation starter. And it was a statement to the market saying, we're open to innovate with you. And I think that mindset shift from a corporate has to take place first. And then fundamentally, then it's, it's about balancing outcomes. And in the last, I guess, 18 months, what I've really learned from the VC space more than anywhere else, and, I, and, I, and I'm really grateful for that, is in corporates, you know, we back solutions. Um, we're, that's the way we've grown up, right? You, you do five-year business plans. You predict what the world will look like five years from now, and you back that solution, and, and then you're in love with that solution, and you live that solution no matter what. I think what the VC space has taught me is you have to fall in love with the problem. You have to know that the problem is real, the problem is big, and it's a problem with a lot of people, for a lot of people. And you must fall in love with the talent that you believe can navigate that problem space. 
the solutions will iterate and change so many times as it goes through the development. And that's a huge sort of learning that, that, that I shared today here. Um, and, and I think that shift in focus is, is sort of a pretty, pretty big foundation uh, for, for at least our approach. Uh, thank you for sharing, uh, Naku. And, um, and uh, I, I think that uh, we have uh, reached the end of the time for this panel discussion. Uh, just to conclude, today we have heard the potential of BDES technology from Hans. And also, um, you know, we, we are hoping to see more co cooperation between Singapore and Norway in the BDES technology. We also heard the potential of a 5G, 5, 5G technology from, um, from uh, Francois and and we hope that there are more projects uh, coming up uh, relating to 5G for the maritime uh, industry. I think some of the teams mentioned were like uh, uh, autonomous operations, drones, and also some port uh, operations as well. So we look forward to that. And for Peter, thanks a lot for your sharing from a ship uh, manager perspective. We see some uh, projects uh, such as the... Um, uh, coming up, such as the uh, telemedicine and also the uh, drone projects. And finally, uh, Naku, thanks for sharing with us your open philosophy on uh, how uh, open innovation uh, project works. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, you all uh, for your time and for this uh, panel discussion. Um, we see that there are both business and research collaboration opportunities in the area of marine time communication. Uh, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. And we shall now go into a five minute break before we start on some exciting presentations on different solutions and case studies from Singapore and Norway.